Order, order. Uh, the uh, next item on the order paper is a motion on mental health and well-being after COVID-19. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. That this assembly recognises the importance of prioritising mental health and well-being as part of the COVID-19 recovery. Notes that the long-term impact of the pandemic on working practices, everyday social interaction and hospital or care home visiting will present new and substantive challenges to individual mental well-being, especially among the most vulnerable. Stresses, therefore, the need for refreshed and reformed mental health and well-being service provision that is fit for purpose. Further notes to this end the transformative role played by community and voluntary providers whose services are subject to increasing demand, and calls on the Minister of Health to outline plans to tackle COVID-19 related mental illness moving forward. Thank you. I call upon Mrs Pam Cameron to move the motion. Mrs Cameron. Thank you, Mr Temporary Speaker. I beg to move. Thank you, Mrs Cameron. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes uh, for this debate. Two amendments have been selected and are published on the Marshall list. Uh, therefore, an additional 15 minutes has been allocated to the total time. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes, and they, those who are winding up will also have 10 minutes. Uh, Mrs Cameron. Again, thank you, Mr Temporary Speaker. And at this stage, I wish to indicate that we will be accepting both the amendments to the motion, and I thank both Sinn Féin and the UUP for their thoughtful additions to the motion before us. While much focus in recent months has rightly been on the physical well-being of our population as we face the threat of coronavirus, the impact on mental health must not be forgotten. The restrictions placed on personal freedoms and everyday social interaction during lockdown have had a profound effect on emotional and psychological well-being of people living in Northern Ireland. Worryingly, the cross-cutting nature of the impact of the virus and subsequent regulations have come into direct conflict with established triggers of mental illness, including social isolation, loss of work and general financial concerns, medical trauma and work-related stress. The steps taken in good faith on the basis of scientific evidence by the executive to protect lives were necessary. However, we must ensure that the benefits are not overshadowed by long-term harm by unaddressed mental health issues. As we continue the pathway to normalisation, to reopening our health service, I believe mental health and wellbeing must be at the forefront of the Department of Health's priorities. That is why we have brought this motion today, and I trust that we can unite as a house behind it. Poor mental health is not a new problem faced by our society. It is not one of the many new consequences of COVID-19. Pre-COVID, the, the issue of mental health and the need for targeted intervention was already clear. One in five of our population identified as having a mental health issue at one time in their lives. Over half of our HSC nursing staff reporting to be injured or unwell as a result of workplace stress in a 2019 survey. On a daily basis, we are hearing on our news bulletins through our contacts in the community of lives lost to suicide. Our community was already struggling. Mr Temporary Speaker, the reality is that COVID-19 has, has exacerbated this problem. A study by researchers from the Stress, Trauma and Research Conditions Lab at Queen's University Belfast surveyed 2,500 people living in the UK during the first month of COVID-19 lockdown period. It found that one third of those surveyed met the criteria for anxiety, one third for depression, 20% met the criteria for COVID-19 related to PTSD, 50% of those surveyed report concern about financial impact of the pandemic. Professor Armour, who led the research, concluded the following, and I quote, based on the figures reported in the study related to mental ill health during lockdown, funding should be provided for an uplift to mental health workforce to support um, the potential influx of individuals needing mental health support. A second study by University of Ulster and University of Sheffield reported that in total across the week of the study, 25% of women, 18% of men exhibited clinically meaningful symptoms of anxiety, 23% of women and 21% of men showed signs of depression. Those aged under 35 living in a city, living alone or with children with lower incomes, with health conditions and those whose incomes had been hit by the pandemic had higher rates of, of anxiety and depression. Those who felt they belonged to their neighbourhood and trusted their neighbours had lower levels of anxiety and depression. Members, I am sure, like me, learning these survey figures is sobering. It's a microcosm of the problem within our wider society, and one that must be tackled. 
The depth of the problem is stark, and it could well worsen as issues like unemployment grow as a result of the economic tsunami that COVID-19 has rocked on our local economy. Financial loss and unemployment have strong links with mental ill health, with the risk doubling if someone loses their job. That is why the support given to local businesses has been so vital, and I commend my colleague Diane Dodds for all her work and indeed the vast levels of support from Her Majesty's Government. Mr Temporary Speaker, just as we have risen to the challenge of COVID-19, we must also rise to the challenge of its legacy in terms of mental health. The onus does fall on the Minister of Health in this regard. I do hasten to add that the Minister of Health and his, and his officials have acted responsibly under unprecedented pressure during this crisis. The publication of the Mental Health Action Plan and the COVID-19 Response Plan annexed to it provide a constructive platform on which to progress this debate. I welcome the plan brought forward by the Minister and know that it is a matter that he identified as a priority before coronavirus struck. Looking at one issue from the plan, we are supportive of the proposal to establish a model for specialist perinatal mental health services by September. Northern Ireland is currently the only region without a dedicated mother and baby unit, and that is vital that we accommodate more compassionate care at this critical time for bonding and development. However, one major concern with the plan as it stands is that to the most extents and purposes, it's cost neutral and therefore cannot hope to make the transformative reforms needed to mental health services without additional agreement on comprehensive funding to take forward the 38 actions. The total cost of the Mental Health Action Plan in the first year is up to £2.8 million. The recurring cost of the much-needed new specialist perinatal mental health service alone is expected to be up to £3.6 million per year moving forward. This requires a strong signal from the Executive, including the Department of Health, and generosity of spirit to move forward with the agenda to reform and refresh the current provision. We need to look at solutions, and I believe that is key. what is key to that is cross-cutting approach to mental health well-being, given health inequalities and longer-term changes to how society operates. Health inequalities research by the Department of Health has indicated strong links between deprivation, age and gender on, on infection and, and admission rates within, with COVID-19. Similar correlations between the virus and higher rates of anxiety and depression have been found amongst those aged under 35 living in a city, living alone or with children, with medical conditions and those in financial hardship. In this sense, when bringing forward this motion, we are acutely aware that it is not just an issue relevant to the public health response or health and social care, but something that has to be tied to and targeted toward as social and economic factors that lead to mental illness. A one-size-fits-all approach cannot be effective. Cross-cutting, cross-departmental, cross-sectoral approach is required. Indeed, departments like DUP departments like education, our ministers are actively working on plans to address the legacy of COVID-19 on children who are already identified as at risk prior to the pandemic and whose physical, mental and educational well-being may have been acutely disadvantaged by the loss of contact and, and or closure of schools. So while the Minister takes the lead, we want to work with him across executive to tackle these issues in a collaborative and effective way. A particular example is looking towards our arts sector. And I would appeal to this executive to recognise the huge contribution that arts and culture makes in terms of mental health outcomes and understand this particular sector do face huge challenges ahead and require support if they are to survive. And that collaborative approach must go further. A vibrant and well-resourced community and voluntary sector is key to success. With the unprecedented demand on health and social care capacity, mental health wellbeing charities and faith-based organisations have been a lifeline for providing early and skilled response to those at risk of mental illness during this pandemic. Their contact with vulnerable groups, including the elderly and those shielding, have been an invaluable preventative tool against mental ill health. This contribution has come in the midst of increasing demand and fewer resources, putting many organisations at risk of folding. There needs to be a serious look at what we can do to support the sustainable future of our sector moving forward. I wish to put on record my full appreciation for the mental health provision from the community and voluntary sector, such as Impact Network NI, based in Randallstown, a great example of an invaluable service to the community. Service providers in the community and voluntary sector must be at the heart of the recovery and reform process. The focus must be on co-design and co-production of the new services at regular dialogue. As departments seek to wade their way through the financial outworking of COVID-19 expenditure, any tendency to look for community providers as an easy target for more savings must be opposed. 
Mr. Temporary Speaker, in conclusion, I would be remiss of me not to make special mention of one group of people for whom we must deliver support for, and that's our frontline healthcare workers. What they have encountered, what they have seen, had to do, both on the wards and in the care homes, but also in terms of sacrificing family life, has had a huge impact on so many nurses, doctors and other healthcare workers. I urge the Minister to ensure all necessary support is in place for our heroes. So, Mr Temporary Speaker, I am pleased to bring this motion uh, this evening and urge members to unite behind it. Thank you. Um, I beg to move. Thank you, Mrs Flynn. Um, you have ten minutes to propose amendment number one and five minutes to wind. Mrs Flynn. Gorham uh, last can call you. Um, I would like to thank the members who have brought the motion to this House today. The challenge before all of us is how to improve mental health and wellbeing as we gradually emerge from the COVID-19 lockdown. This will not be an easy task, but it is an essential one. Mental health and wellbeing are not just the responsibility of the Health Minister. Mental health and wellbeing are the responsibility of all ministers and their departments. On the amendment I am proposing, I believe that it adds to the motion and, importantly, draws attention towards the needs of addiction services and the challenges of a dual diagnosis. I want to begin this speech by paying tribute to all of the organisations and staff working in the field of mental health and to all those who regularly attend the All-Party Group on Suicide Prevention, including many of the members within this chamber whom I know care deeply about this issue. I also want to pay a special tribute to all those across our communities who are struggling with their own mental health problems. I want you to know that even when you feel most alone and isolated, that there are people out there who want to help. There are services that want to help. Our new reality is that COVID-19 will be part of our lives for the foreseeable future, and it will have a lasting impact on communities across the island, even without a second wave. Anxiety is being felt across all communities, across all sectors of our economy, and we as a body must be well prepared to deal with the challenges this will pose. I acknowledge that in the early weeks of this pandemic, the Department of Health took on board my recommendation to create a dedicated page for mental health and wellbeing advice. I also acknowledge that the Health Minister has expressed to me, both verbally and in writing, um, around his commitment to progress and develop a new and improved substance misuse strategy alongside and as part of the wider Mental Health Action Plan and the 10-year strategy. So the question is now, how will the wider health and social care system respond to the mental health challenges that we face in the time ahead? Will there be a clear and dedicated mental health action plan that has adequate resources attached to it? I do note that the Minister has previously announced the appointment of the mental health champion. And again, although this is very welcome, we still need to see the Minister of Health being our ultimate champion for improving mental health services, including addiction services. I agree that there needs to be more resources for mental health and wellbeing. It is also important that we see mental health and wellbeing in every programme from every department and not just from the Department of Health. For example, the resilience and wellbeing framework being developed by the Education Authority for young people in our schools again is a step in the right direction. However, this must now also take into account the legacy of COVID-19. How will the Department of the Economy measure the impact of job losses and financial worry? And how will the financial stress being felt across our communities be factored into tangible supports for all our business and workers? Every department and every arm's length body must be asked the same pertinent question. How are you promoting the well-being, the health and the mental health of all your staff and service users? Although there is clearly a need for all departments to respond and collaborate, I do believe this will be best placed within the executive working group that was established for mental health. The Department of Health must also have its own detailed plan to respond to the need for greater mental health services and addiction services. 
A few weeks ago, the Health Committee received an oral briefing from organisations providing these services, and I would really urge all members to go back and to listen to some of the stark evidence from these groups, as it is a testimony to the struggle in providing addiction services to those suffering most from those issues and with mental health challenges on top of that. It is very clear to see that the sector is deeply concerned about how the lockdown has affected those service users who are already seeking help, and indeed those who will in the future need those services due to COVID-19 and the lockdown. I want to take a bit of time to explore a bit further just around this issue of dual diagnosis. A dual diagnosis is when someone has to choose between addressing their mental health condition or addressing their addiction first. It is often the case that both are interlinked, but services are unable to respond, or worse, they are not there to respond at all. I recently asked the Minister a question regarding dual diagnosis, and I thank him again for his response, which is as follows. Quote, there are no legal barriers within the Mental Health Order 1986 prohibiting the establishment of a dual diagnosis service for addictions and mental health. Unquote. So, while this sounds positive, um, what it actually says is that the barrier to putting the person first is not actually because of the legislation, but because maybe they don't fit neatly into a predefined box when, when they're looking for help and support. So, as services are rebuilt and commissioned in the future, it's vital that they're person centred and that they take into full account um, the individual needs. And we need to consider that the individual needs for many may require treatment for those who are battling with both a mental health problem and an addiction. I will finish my comments in welcoming some, of the, um, some more of the positive co news coming from the Department of Health recently, um, just in and around the innovative programme towards zero suicide, um, and that that programme is going to be resuming in July. Um, again, that was one of the, the aspects of mental health and suicide prevention that have been impacted by COVID-19 and the pandemic, and now must adapt, along with everything else, to, to, to meet people's needs post-COVID and the demand on services. Um, however, I also did raise my concerns at the last committee meeting that the department did only put a bid in for just over £2 million in additional monies in the June budgeting allocations for mental health and suicide prevention. And just to finish, in my view, all of this needs to be considered in the context that our mental health services, as we all know, are already under pressure, that the suicide prevention strategy, a big piece of work, still has to be fully implemented. And then on top of all that, we're now expecting a possible surge in demand for services as we exit the lockdown restrictions. So I just want to lend my support to um, this motion and again thank the members very much for, for bringing it. I'm happy to support it and I hope members will lend their support to my amendment also. Gormiogut. Could I thank Mrs Cameron and Mrs Flynn for the succinct way in which they put both the motion and the amendment. That should allow, uh, I hope, extra speakers to take part in this debate. I now call upon Mr Robbie Butler to move amendment number two. I beg to move. Uh, thank you, Mr Butler. You will have ten minutes to propose amendment two and five minutes to wind, and all other speakers will have five minutes each. Mr Butler. Thank you, Mr. Temporary Speaker, if that is the, the right terminology. I won't use my full ten minutes. Um, as Fallon Morrison once said in the final words of his song, his, his spoken song, Coney Island, why can't it be like this all the time? And on a debate as important as mental health and ultimately suicide prevention, we couldn't be talking about anything more important here in this chamber tonight. Uh, it's one of the only ones that I won't have absolute written notes because I'm so passionate about it. And I want to thank um, the parties that have brought forward both the motion, uh, Ms Cameron, the amendment by uh, Orlea and Sinn Féin. There was another amendment put forward by the SDLP which very much mirrored our own amendment and I would be speaking in favour of the motion and both amendments tonight and I would urge every member in here also to support that. Um, there is no doubt that mental health is everyone's business. Now, I had written a few things down here in preparation for, for speaking. And do you know something? You get two um, uh, members have blown me out of the water it, because you've got it in spades. You have accepted that mental health is everyone's business. And whilst the purpose and the intent of the motion uh, called on the health minister recognises that actually this is across the full executive. 
This is the Department of Communities, this is the Department of Justice, this is the economy, and this is education. Because if we're actually going to catch the tail of this problem and this epidemic that we've got, which existed long before COVID came, then we have to act responsibly. We have to act in a collegiate manner and a collegiate fashion. And whilst I will get to the COVID-specific issues in a minute, I'm particularly uh, pleased with the contribution so far because mental health isn't new and poor mental health isn't new. And the problems that people are facing out of COVID existed before, and they are the same problems. Um, already ha that has been mentioned is perinatal mental health um, by uh, Ms Cameron. Um, th that is, that's so important because if we can't get off to the right start with, with mums who are pregnant and babies in those early years, what are we storing up for ourselves in the future? And the Minister has already made a commitment to that. And I'm sure if he had the, the, the support of his executive and in terms of the finance, we could do much more. And I believe if we work collegiately, to use the word again, we could achieve much more. I'm now on the Education Committee. And I can assure you, if you sit in, in that Education Committee, as happened today in the Chamber with the Minister, every opportunity that I get and other members get from other parties is used to say, well, what are you doing to tackle mental ill health? What the fabric of the building, the support that teachers can get, the support of our teachers, the support of our pupils, and the support of families uh, and their children. And as we've talked about, I mean, I became a member in 2016, and we, we talked about the correlation between poverty, social deprivation, criminality, addictions, and poor mental health. Those are all things that are in the fabric of our society in Northern Ireland that we really need to tackle and get to grips with. And it's, it's probably worth noting that a number of reports actually point out that through this COVID pandemic, addictions of themselves have found that people are, you know, alcohol, gambling, uh, and, and even drugs are being targeted to those most vulnerable. So in their downtime, they're being exposed to even greater risk. And we really need to do something about that. It's my absolute privilege to, to chair the, uh, one of the new all-party groups, and that is tackling gambling-related harm. And I'd like to be, that to be put on note, that that is a real issue through this COVID pandemic, that those people who are gambling addicts are coming to real harm. And that is something that I look forward to the Communities Minister looking at with regard to new legislation. And the, uh, Orlea Flynn, the, the, the chair of the all-party group on suicide, I'd like to commend her work with regard to... Uh, the, the targeting of the message towards a zero, zero suicide figure, which is something that we would indeed support. Now, there are many reports on poor mental health across many communities and many sectors, and uh, I would urge everyone to not allow us to, be, uh, to get to the point of paralysis by analysis. We are reported out. We have enough reports. We know what we should be doing, and we need to target our resources and support each other and put our collective shoulders to the wheel, not just with the executive, but in this assembly to actually see real progress. It was good to note that in the, the first two speakers so far, they have given the, the Health Minister credit because he didn't just look at COVID and say, I'm going to sit here and look at this. He followed through with his pre, um, the, the, the pre-New Decade and New Approach commitments and said, OK, we're going to have that mental health action plan. And that has started. We're going to look at the mental health champion, a commitment from 2016, and I hope that that's delivered very soon. And then the further commitment for the mental health strategy by December of this year starting and looking at a 10-year strategy, all very welcome, all very needed and in fact will help us save lives. And now we have the impact of COVID and all of those COVID-related manners, which whilst they don't complicate it, just perhaps consolidate our focus on the need to do this together. I think that's what it does. It doesn't make it any more complicated, guys. What are those, comp those COVID implications? One of them, and the most stark for me, is the bereavement that bereavement process when people have died at the time through COVID and people haven't been able to grieve and have their burial and have their wake in the normal manner that we're accustomed to. That is something that's going to have an outcome and a cost to bear and we need to support those people. Loneliness and isolation. I'd like to um, just commend um, Sinead Bradley. She's the chair of the APG on loneliness and has been, and has been leading the, the battle on that. But loneliness existed before COVID. It's been magnified and exacerbated. It's the society we live in. It's a societal change we need, and we need to provide the leadership for that. There's the visiting restrictions in hospitals, there's the visiting restrictions in nursing homes, and, and the inability to see those people who are probably either on pal a palliative path, or they're certainly ill, and could be doing with a cuddle, or a handshake, or a kiss. Those are, those are things that should resonate with each and every one of us. 
with refugees and asylum seekers who already at times find it difficult to integrate in our communities? Have we forgot about those people during this COVID crisis? I hope not. I was on a call, I think on Friday there, with a, with a group, and it was interesting. And they were talking about the Northern Irish uh, spirit and how much they enjoy being here. But during COVID, did we do enough? We certainly need to try harder. And I'm sure, like me, your inboxes through this um, pandemic have you've probably been busier than you were even before. There's been no respite for us, and I'm not asking anybody to have any sympathy. But what you will know is that there is an impact on everybody that's been contacting you, whether it's been a business that's been struggling to, get to, to, to work out the furlough, to work out their, whether they're entitled to grants, and there's been great work done. But all of that stress and all of that angst just adds up into a toxic mix, and that's where, where, where sometimes mental health and ill mental health comes from. But as has been pointed out, we have to give thanks to those that have been standing in the gap, those that have been bridging the gap and meeting the need of those people who, for instance, perhaps already had poor mental health. Those nurses, doctors, care workers, those people who are working in the community, still working in the community through very difficult circumstances, uh, and in many instances probably not being paid enough to do the job that they do, providing that link between the outside world and that loneliness of, of living alone or or, or, or in hospital for treatment and, and, and enduring sicknesses. So for those nurses and care workers, we say thank you. For those doctors that, that stand in the gap, we say thank you. But I suppose the biggest purpose of this motion is to talk about uh, those community groups and those charities who have showed great innovation um, over these past weeks. And it's been wonderful to see. They've had to adapt their strategies, their way of working to meet the needs and the, the, the differing needs of those people who needed them. In Lagan Valley and Lisburn, there's a few that I'll just mention, and forgive me if anybody's listening and I'll miss you out, but the Atlas Women's Centre, Fire Wings and Dremore, Resurgum, and the Balmakai's COVID response. To see those guys who actually, when they went out, maybe even with food, to give food, met a different need, they didn't even know sometimes the benefit of what they were doing, just smiling at somebody and showing kindness, guys. Kindness. Kindness is a big part of this cure. Okay? It's better than a tablet. And I think it's something that we can lead the way on. So that's why, I, like Van Morrison said, why can't it be like this all of the time? Um, but uh, I totally wasn't going to talk for 10 minutes. I probably am. I'm probably going to use the last minute and a half, if that's okay. Um, just to pull this together, there's only one way this will work, guys. And it's not just Robin Swan. Department of Health Minister's responsibility. It's a collective responsibility. It's perhaps, and I see this as how this executive might work in the longer term. If we can prioritise mental health, protecting and saving life, does it matter if you're a unionist, nationalist or other or neither? Does it really? Can we show the people out there that actually we've got a priority that we share and we're going to work collectively to achieve it? I think out of the legacy of one of our uh, our, our most regrettable circumstance, which is the levels of poor mental health and the high rates of suicide. If we can look at one of our darkest marks and do something transformative, what a light this place could be. We will be supporting the amendments and the motion. Thank you. Uh, I now call upon Paula Bradshaw. Paula Bradshaw. Mr. Um, temporary Speaker, I rise on behalf of the Alliance Party to support the motion and both amendments. I would like to thank the members for bringing these forward today for discussion. Very timely and absolutely crucial as we re-establish our health and social care services. That time is taken to ensure that we include a firm understanding of the state of our nation's health and well-being as we emerge from this health crisis and make decisions with this information going forward. To do this, we need to look at the needs of those most affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. As such, we should look at the hundreds of families across the country who lost loved ones to the coronavirus, plunged into immense sadness and have been curtailed in their grieving process due to the health protection regulations. Then we have the many others who became infected, ended up in hospital needing urgent treatment, faced with the prospect of death, and now have a long road to recovery, both physically and mentally. Our doctors, nurses, and whole, whole health and social care family have been working at the front line dealing with the most critical of conditions of this new virus that nobody could have predicted would sweep across our society. Further, we have to recognise that many of these key workers also live with their own underlying health conditions or live in households with loved ones who do. How incredibly scary and traumatic for them 
just having to go to work during this pandemic, knowing the risk. We then need to focus on those for whom lockdown has been um, equally traumatic. We have to recognise that for them, this isolation from mainstream society has had such a devastating impact on them, where in ordinary circumstances they are able to manage or at least cope with their pre-existing mental health issues with engagement and activity, and suddenly they have been trapped in their own homes and their conditions worsened. This will have been particularly prevalent in homes where carers look after loved ones who have learning or physical disabilities, who, can, who again, conditions have worsened due to the loss of daily routine and external support. Sadly, we saw a spike in reported cases of domestic and sexual violence during the pandemic. As the motion states, the community and voluntary sector had to move quickly and very innovatively to reconfigure their services to respond to this spike, and we should be grateful to them. I'm thinking of Women's Aid, Men's Advisory Project, NSPCC, Bernardo's Nexus, and many more. I don't know whether we will ever know nor be able to estimate the number of unreported cases, the number of men, women and children who suffered in silence, had to live with their abuser during this time and will sadly have to continue to do so. We also have to acknowledge the other societal and economic issues that will have exasperated, sorry, been exasperated by the pandemic and which will greatly impact on the nation's well-being. The loss of employment leading to increased poverty the rise in alcohol use, drug abuse and gambling addiction, all of which will have had a detrimental impact on feelings of self-worth and shame. I think the Sinn Féin motion reflects this need in terms of dual diagnosis and the need to not compartmentalise issues, as um, Ms Flynn outlined. One further point I would make is in relation to the need for specialised psychiatric treatment for gambling addiction in extreme cases. This is not available here, and I think that the, the strategy going forward should incorporate that. Therefore, it is important that this action plan from the Health Minister via his Department for the Development of a 10-Year Strategy reads right across all aspects of society and also looks at the causes and contributors. And to achieve this, the public engagement aspect of developing the plan has to be extensive and creative. We know, for example, that there are high levels of mental health among young people living with learning disabilities, no doubt, as I said, made worse during the pandemic. How can we properly ensure that they are included in the, this process and have their voices heard? How can the principles of co-design and co-production be configured to reach the hardest to reach sections of our society? I would end, Mr De um, Temporary Speaker, in referencing the UUP amendment in terms of recognising the need for cross-cutting efforts across departments and all public services, and then the need to find ways to measure this in terms of outcomes and not outputs. To seriously tackle mental health issues, we are going to need serious investment, which I fully support. However, we need to ensure that the money is spent wisely and effectively, and so thought is going to have to be required to put in place a society-wide mechanism for measuring impact and our collective well-being. Thank you. And I call Cara Hunter. Ms Hunter. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the SDLP will be supporting uh, both the motion before us and both amendments here today. And I would like to thank the members here today who have brought this important motion uh, and amendments forward. I also welcome uh, the Minister's ongoing proven commitment um, to mental health. COVID-19 has undoubtedly reshaped how we function as a society. It has shifted our coping mechanisms, our family dynamics, our work practices, our parenting methods and so much more. We agree fundamentally with members here today that post-COVID-19 acts as a moment of opportunity to set priorities and define key action points to improve and enhance our mental health provision, addressing its gaps and implementing improvement wherever necessary. New challenges require new solutions. After talking with representatives from the voluntary sector in my constituency, many were subject to increasing demand throughout COVID-19, especially groups that work with uh, domestic violence victims. The pressures put on these services throughout the pandemic highlight and prove how crucial it is that voluntary groups and charities must be well protected and funded correctly. The conversation of addiction diagnosis and treatment included before us here today is an important one. Recent figures announced by Addiction NI show that the number of men dying from drug-related causes has increased by 98% in the last 10 years. The emphasis within the amendment before us further highlights how addiction and issues with alcohol dependency can be borne out of, access, out 
uh, of a lack of access to mental health support, leaving many eventually to feel even more vulnerable. We feel, of course, there is also a rural dynamic to this conversation. Rural isolation causes barriers to access of services. In Protect Life 2, the primary health and social care need of rural citizens is identified as availability and provision of timely and high quality suicide prevention and self-harm services. Before COVID-19, many in rural areas were already experiencing mass changes, especially depopulation and migration in some areas. So issues like this are having an impact with a sense of loss of community. Rural barriers to mental health support can also include more conservative approaches to help seeking and heightened stigma around mental illness. This is something we must consider moving forward. Access and support requires a collaborative and coordinated response. Earlier this year, I wrote to the Minister for Health to ask that bereavement support services are well supported throughout and post COVID-19. Given the traumatic nature of recent deaths and the denial of regular burial ceremonies throughout this pandemic, I am deeply concerned for the mental health of those who have lost a loved one throughout this pandemic. The lack of usual support uh, from friends, family and community have been denied to families who have recently lost a family member. The past few months of restrictions have caused great distress for those grieving. With the loss of so many lives, it is paramount that bereavement support services, organisations and charities across the North are well supported. Lastly, in striving to achieve the aims of this motion and the amendments at hand, it is imperative that collaboration continues between public, private sector organisations, academics, professional bodies, service users and community agencies. Many of my constituents have voiced their fear of returning to normal because normal wasn't working. Now is our opportunity to change that. There has been some discussion about the vintage class of 1998. Very few survivors, of course, but of course I call the youngest of the class of 1998, the Honourable Member for East Antrim, Mr Hildich. Thank you, Mr Tamperey. Deputy Speaker, uh, and I certainly acknowledge your elevation from the back benches, even though it may only be on a temporary basis, but congratulations. Uh, I rise in support of the motion and the positive merits of the amendments also, and the last few months have created a significant amount of fear, worry and concern in the population at large, but particularly among certain groups such as those with underlying conditions, older folk and carers, providers. We have uh, seen a significant psychological impact manifest itself in increasing levels of stress and anxiety pre-pandemic. However, after three months of lockdown with changes to many people's usual activities, routines and livelihoods, the levels of loneliness, depression, harmful alcohol and drug use and the self-harm or suicidal behaviour are also expected to rise. The restrictions placed upon personal freedoms and everyday social interaction during lockdown have had a profound effect on emotional and psychological well-being of people living within our community. We can all experience the mental health problems, whatever our background or walk of life, but the risk of experiencing mental health, ill health is not equally distributed across our society. Those who face the greatest disadvantages in life also face the greatest risk to their mental health. A study by the University of uh, Ulster and the University of Sheffield reported that those aged under 35 living in a city, living alone or with children with lower incomes, with health conditions and those whose incomes have been hit by the pandemic have higher rates of anxiety and depression. The distribution of infections and deaths during the COVID-19 pandemic, the lockdown, the associated measures and the longer-term socio-economic impact are likely to replicate and deepen financial inequalities that contribute towards the increased prevalence and unequal distribution of mental ill health. Academic research has indicated that the incidence of mental health illness in Northern Ireland during COVID-19 have continued to reflect the 25 per cent higher prevalent of other parts of the UK. The mental health risk of economic hardship starts early in life. Socioeconomical disadvantaged children and adolescents are two or three times more likely to develop mental health problems. The World Health Organization has determined that material disadvantage trumps emotional and intellectual advantages. In other words, people from poor economic circumstances are more likely to have worse mental health, even if they have been supported to develop good personal coping and intellectual skills. 
People with an existing psychiatric diagnosis are also at a greater risk of financial inequality and less likely to be in employment, fueling their experience of multiple disadvantage. Furthermore, debt itself is an issue. People in debt are more likely to have a common mental health problem, and the more debt people have, the greater that, that likelihood is. One in four people experiencing a mental health issue is in problem debt, and people with mental health problems are three times more likely to be in financial difficulty. Studies have found that the unemployment has a range of negative effects, including relative poverty or a drop in standards of living for those who had a job, stress is associated with financial insecurity, and the shame sometimes of being unemployed and in recent receipt of social welfare and loss of vital social networks. The Organisation of Economic Cooperation and Development has described how loss has a traumatic and immediate negative impact on mental health and noted that there is further damage where unemployment continues into the long term. A meta-analysis has shown that unemployment is associated with varieties of distress, including mixed symptoms of distress, depression, anxiety, psychomatic symptoms and drops in subjective well-being and self-esteem. The same study found that 34 per cent of unemployment people experience mental distress compared to 16 per cent of those in employment. Importantly, the analysis showed that unemployment causes this distress. Research has constantly shown the unemployment has been associated with lower well-being. Furthermore, job insecurity and restructuring also have negative impacts on, impacts on employee well-being. Unless action is taken to protect the vulnerable people's economic security and support them in dealing with the resulting stress, mental health inequalities are likely to increase as the pandemic and the economic turndown will proceed. Thus, it is a necessity that a collaborative, cross-cutting, cross-departmental and cross-sectorial approach is created. No one department can tackle this alone. There is a need to address the social and economic can the factors. Can member bring his comments to close, please? Mental illness. I say it, I, I uh, rise in, in favour of the, uh, the motion, and I'm certainly happy to take on the amendments as well. Thank you. Thank you. Good call, Mr. Patchian. Patchian. Kormai, good Alas, Kian Korla, Shaladak. Thanks very much. And like uh, others who have spoken here today, I want to commend those members of the the community and voluntary sector who have done so much during this pandemic not just in terms of delivering parcels and things like that, but, but keeping lines of communication open. I mean, one of the organisations in the constituents I represent in West Belfast, the White Rock Children's Centre, deals all year round with uh, asylum seekers, refugees, immigrants, and people like that, who are people who are vulnerable to begin with, and many other families that are living in dire poverty. And, and they have continued their operation and scaled it up while this pandemic has gone on. In the Ardmona Family Centre, there is a project called Good Morning West Belfast, which long predates this pandemic, when uh, volunteers and staff phone up uh, elderly and vulnerable people every day, twice a day sometimes, to check on them, to make sure they are all right, that they have someone to talk to. And it is not just a quick 20-second uh, call. Sometimes it is a yarn. It's a conversation with those people who have no one else to, to speak to. So I want to, to commend those organisations. And I want to, to speak about health inequalities here today. And we were all surprised, I think, when the minister was in the committee the other week uh, and said that affluent areas have been affected disproportionately by the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. Uh, and now that there has been more drilling down into the data, it now appears that that wasn't accurate, and I'm not surprised. Uh, I mean, disadvantaged areas are disproportionately affected by conditions like obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, hypertension, dementia, all flagged up as serious risk factors in COVID-19. And disadvantaged areas also suffer disproportionately from mental ill health, suicide, and addiction. And there was already a serious mental health crisis before this pandemic uh, arrived. And I don't think anything, anyone here would disagree that the mental health crisis is going to be immeasurably uh, worse as, as we move through this pandemic and come out the other side. Uh, 
In West Belfast, uh, w- one of the wards is, uh, is the White Rock Ward uh, in, in the West Belfast constituency. And in previous years, it has always been at the bottom of all the socio-economic indices. And in the past couple of years, uh, it has actually moved up the table a bit. Uh, it has improved. There are maybe other wards have dis- disimproved. I'm not sure what way it works. But in any event, it has always remained rooted at the very bottom uh, of the health domain. And, and mental ill health is a big, big issue, as is suicide and addiction. Uh, and, and often the three, as uh, earlier Flynn mentioned earlier on, are interlinked. And I would ask every member in the House here today to imagine yourself ingrained in poverty, maybe a single parent, living in poor housing, damp and cold, kids getting ill because of the poor conditions of the house, missing school frequently, falling behind, leaving school without qualifications. As we know, kids who leave school without qualifications frequently end up in the criminal justice system. Children taking their own lives. Parents taking their own lives, leaving children behind as orphans. And that's the grim reality of life for some of our citizens out there today. Uh, And that may be the extreme end of it. But that is day and daily what's happening in our disadvantaged uh, areas. And previous speakers have mentioned the need for cross-departmental uh, approach to deal with these issues, and I accept that. The Health Minister can't solve these problems on his own, but he has a responsibility to do his share of the heavy list- lifting. We need parity of funding between physical and mental health, and the urgency that has been employed in the fight against coronavirus should also be involved in this scourge of mental ill health uh, in, in our society. And when Michelle O'Neill was the health minister, I constantly said that we should be working collaboratively on health because health doesn't... Certainly, yes. So I accept that that spirit of, of cross-executive work and still works, but is, is still in place between myself and the former health minister, and that will give him an extra minute to, to finish the point he's, he's yeah. making. Uh, Absolutely, I agree with that. And and the point I was going to finish on was that, irrespective of what minister is in position in the health department or what party they come from, uh, all the parties should be working together collaboratively to ensure the the well-being and health of our society improves. Thank you, Mr Sheehan. Just to uh, bring members up to date, there are five speakers left. So if everyone sticks to time, I think we can get everybody in. I'm conscious of the fact that Mr Carl from People Before Profit is a member of the Health Committee, so therefore I'm going to give him priority now. And then I'm going to call after that Mr Middleton, Mr McGuigan and Mr Mr. Little and hopefully the Honourable Member for North Down, Ms Woods. Thank you, Mr Henry Speaker, and thanks for your uh, early call on myself. Sometimes debates, members from smaller parties don't get called, so I'm glad you called it myself. Um, and I, th- I want to thank the members uh, for bringing this motion to the, to the House. Um, I thank the members for bringing the amendments uh, as well. Uh, in a debate a few weeks ago, uh, the Health Minister made a point that um, Stormont failed to properly support the NHS uh, for years. And in relation to mental health services, uh, Mr. Temporary Speaker, it's the view of many, including myself, that Stormont has failed to properly invest in and support people with mental health issues and adequately uh, invest in these services over many years. We know, as has been uh, mentioned and alluded to already, people in the north suffer from higher levels of depression, anxiety, and PTSD compared with people in the south uh, or in Britain. Um, we have 25 per cent higher mental health problems here compared with England uh, directly. But we spend less per head on, on mental health services uh, than uh, these places. And as Action Mental Health have stated, there is an actual fact that 26 per cent underspend overall in mental health services generally. 
Um, so we have a massive underspend in mental health services before uh, the coronavirus uh, crisis. And the department's own language is that the mental health impact is likely, likely to be severe. Uh, and GEPs have warned of a tsunami of mental health illness after the coronavirus. And unfortunately, uh, Mr. Temporary Speaker, I don't see uh, way ranging or enough actions from the department or the minister uh, to ref ref reflect that severity or the reality uh, increase of many people uh, that they will face after lockdown uh, ends. So if we are to really support people with mental health uh, with more than just nice and well sound and well-meaning words, we need a serious increased investment in uh, these services to support people. Uh, briefly, yeah. I thank the member for giving way because he doesn't get often a chance to speak, and this will get you an extra minute. Um, just would you, would, you, would you agree with me that the, the minister has actually, in the very short period he's been in place, actually taken exceptional steps to meet the, the epidemic of, of mental ill health and suicide prevention, given that we had a three-year hiatus at this place where mental health was not the priority? The member has now an extra minute. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I thank the member for his question. And, you know, I, I'm. I agree that he's taken measures, but I don't think they're, they're wide-ranging enough, to be frank with you. Uh, not just him, but previous ministers and the executive as a whole as well. Uh, I think we'll have to be honest um, ab about that. Um, I mean, in our budget briefing in the Health Committee, uh, we were told as well um, that there will be £72 million uh, pound savings uh, in the, across the health service, or cuts, as they are uh, most uh, commonly uh, known. Uh, and despite you know, being told that we must learn the mantra of uh, COVID-19 or learn the lessons from it, uh, I don't believe that that lesson uh, has been learned in terms of protecting public services. Uh, and, and on top of that, we've seen um, a 50 per cent increase in significant stress for those people working with uh, people who have had uh, COVID-19, so the people front and centre of uh, supporting people uh, with COVID-19 uh, have actually seen an increase uh, in, own, in their own stress levels as a result of the work that they're doing. Um, and I think it's important to recognise, Mr. Temporary Speaker, that uh, the community came out and clapped for our NHS workers and thanked them for the crucial role that they play throughout the crisis. I'm sure most people here did that as well. I think it is still a disgrace that these workers have not been paid uh, their strike pay, money that was uh, that they lost out because they had to go on strike because their work was not appreciated uh, year after year uh, by uh, this house uh, and uh, Westminster uh, as well. Um, and I think it is uh, urgent that we uh, press on the executive to cough up uh, and pay these workers what they uh, are owed. Uh, and for my part, Mr. Temporary Speaker, you can't give vague messages of support to healthcare workers while it's not supporting them when push comes to shove. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we also heard from the RCN last week on the Health Committee um, about the fact that we have over 2,000, uh, at least 2,000 nursing uh, vacancies across our health service. Not only does this put extra pressure uh, and potentially exacerbate mental health pr uh, problems for those nurses uh, who are working harder than ever, but it does not address the fact that we need to increase our support and investment in the health service generally uh, if we are going to seriously tackle mental health problems in our community. Uh, we urgently, urgently need to see an increase in counsellors, psychiatric nurses, those working in addiction services, and many more uh, workers if we are to support people in need and the increased demand that we are likely to see at the end uh, of this uh, crisis. Uh, and too often, uh, Mr Temporary Speaker, when we are talking about mental health, we talk about it uh, in isolated terms and with very little reference uh, to the environment that people live in, which uh, hugely shapes their mental health. And all predictions are. Uh, if we continue along the usual economic path, then we are going to be stirring into the economic uh, abyss with the worst recession in 300 years. And historically, we know, of course, that suicide rates have skyrocketed in times of economic instability. Um, in the 1929 stock market crash, uh, suicide rates raised, with, um, raised uh, 50 per cent in a year. And there is a direct correlation between unemployment, uh, deprivation, recession, uh, and unfortunately, suicide. So I think we we'll have to see mental health not just as an isolated issue, as, um, as people um, have said, uh, but something that is multifaceted and ultimately connected to economics and politics, and how the executive approaches any new economic strategy needs to rapidly change, not only if we want to protect people's jobs, but protect their mental health. And Stormont needs to embark on an emergency jobs protection and creation programme, which intervenes in the, in the economy to... Uh, Could uh, the member bring his remarks to close, please? 
I'll bring remarks to uh, a close, and I want to pay tribute just to all those people in my own constituency and across the north who have worked very hard to highlight mental health concerns and have helped people throughout this uh, period. Thank you. I call Mr. Gary Middleton. Mr. Middleton. Thank you, uh, temporary speaker, and can I thank my colleagues for bringing this uh, very important motion forward, and to those who brought amendments uh, as well. Uh, thank you for that. I think that it adds to the motion uh, and, and puts a greater emphasis uh, on it as well. Can I also thank the minister uh, for his attendance, and I know that his short time in office, he has already shown uh, a genuine commitment to addressing mental health challenges, and he is committed to doing his share, as others have put it. And I think that, um, that, that it is important that all ministers uh, take their responsibilities for mental health uh, seriously, along with ourselves as MLAs, because uh, as Mr. Butler had said, I think that even through our own actions, I think that we can show uh, real leadership uh, within this chamber uh, in that we're taking mental health very much as a priority. Uh, COVID-19 has brought many challenges impacting on mental health, illness and the loss of life, uh, bereaved families unable to attend uh, and being with their loved ones. Many of us took for granted being able to visit our families, our grandparents and our parents. At life-changing moments, being able to be with our loved ones as they attend their baby scans, uh, visiting loved ones in hospitals and in care homes, these all have impacts on mental health. The economic impacts, the job losses, the income reductions and the uncertainty, uh, all of these things will go on long beyond uh, the COVID-19 restrictions and when those are lifted. The health impacts will also go beyond coronavirus itself and the physical health implications of that. The, the mental health situation in Northern Ireland prior to the pandemic was already at a higher level than other parts of the UK. One in five adults having a mental health problem here at any one time. That's approximately 185,000 people. Very worrying and something that we should all take very seriously. Mental health issues can affect any one of us. Our backgrounds, our age, our religion, our race, our sexuality, none of these things make us immune from poor mental health. However, there is a need for a cross-cutting approach to mental well-being, given the health inequalities and the longer-term changes to how society operates. In terms of coronavirus, health inequalities researched by the Department for Health has indicated strong links between deprivation, age and gender on infection and admission rates with the virus. Similar correlations between the virus and higher risks of anxiety and depression have been found amongst those aged under 35, living in a city, living alone or with children, with health conditions and those whose incomes have been hit. Mr Temporary Speaker, this motion highlights the fact that this issue is not only relevant to the public health response or health and social care, but it's something that has to be tied to and targeted toward the social and economic factors that lead to mental illness. A one-size-fits-all approach cannot be effective. A cross-cutting, departmental and cross-sectoral approach is very much required. I recently met with the Chief Executive of the Western Trust within my own constituency and senior management regarding the Western Trust's reset plan as we come out of COVID-19. The plan is about getting our services working again, allowing people to get back in uh, to our hospitals for all of those routine procedures. It is, however, deeply concerning that they have seen a 52% reduction in mental health referrals. That is something that should absolutely concern us because given the, the evidence that has been produced, it suggests that COVID-19 has had a severe impact on people's mental health. The restrictions placed on personal freedoms and everyday social interaction during lockdown have had a profound impact on emotional and psychological well-being of people living in our community. Uh, some of the figures which members have already touched on uh, through the Queen's University study stated that a third of people have met the cr clinical criteria for depression. Uh, start, uh, that's a very stark statistic. One in five meet the criteria for COVID-19 related PTSD due to the pandemic. The research also indicated that incidences of mental ill health in Northern Ireland during COVID-19 have continued uh, to reflect the 25% higher prevalence than other parts of the UK. My colleague uh, Pam Cameron highlighted the, the uh, conclusion of that report and has stated that funding should be provided 
uh, to ensure that, that the support is there. And finally, I just wanted to comment in relation to the, the uh, crisis intervention service within my own constituency, such as one service that we need to ensure uh, that the funding is there. All of these plans are welcome, but I appreciate that the onus does not just fall with the health minister. I'd urge all ministers to come together and once and for all tackle uh, the issue of mental health in a way that we can try and get a resolution to it. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I call Mr. Philip McGuigan. Mr. McGuigan. Karim Elgood, uh, last can call you. Uh, there is no doubt that measures put in place by the executive during this pandemic would be uh, considered intolerable by anyone uh, in normal circumstances. That these measures had to be put in place to save lives, uh, stop the spread of coronavirus, and protect our health services is also not in doubt, and to that end, they have been successful. One of the positive aspects of this recent period has been that communities have rallied around and people have tried their best to support their friends, families and neighbours. However, the reality is that some have struggled uh, during lockdown, some more than others. And nowhere is that more evident than on the case of people who suffer from poor mental health. Lockdown measures have placed additional challenges on people already struggling. So I welcome today's motion and thank those who have brought it and those who have brought the amendment. It gives us an opportunity to talk about those with poor mental health and how we can uh, improve their situation as we move out of lockdown into the future. Uh, mental health covers a wide range of issues, and other speakers have dealt with many aspects of mental health issues and solutions very eloquently and with great knowledge and empathy, and I agree with their contributions. I support fully the call for a detailed plan, including how to rebuild and provide enhanced mental health and addiction services. And it's on the subject of addiction and its services, or unfortunately, a lack of in some cases that I want to specifically talk about today. You know, I will always congratulate uh, the Minister and my constituency colleague on his good work uh, when need be, uh, but I do have to begin today by saying I am disappointed to see little or no mention of addiction in the Minister's strategic framework for rebuilding services in his mental health action plan nor in his post-COVID plans. Lockdown has had a detrimental impact on the mental health well-being of many individuals recovering from addiction. I know this because I have spoken to them. There has obviously been difficulties in some sectors engaging with service users due to restrictions. For many, access to support groups formed a key part of their individual coping strategy. For some, it was the ability to see friends regularly or their routine encouragement of, and support from family. For others, it was their structured groups and services that either had to close or that saw experienced staff being redeployed to COVID-19 duties. What concerns me most about the legacy of lockdown is that it is a lot easier to close a service than to reopen it. Having to stay in the house, boredom, added stress or worry, perhaps in situations where more disposable income is available or in cases where less disposable income is available, uh, have all contributed to the daily struggles uh, of those who suffer from addiction, particularly those in early recovery. And for the very same reasons, others not yet in recovery but practising alcoholics, uh, prescription or illegal drug users, compulsive gamblers, lockdown will have exacerbated their problems and brought more despair to them and their families. Addiction is an illness. As a recovering alcoholic and compulsive gambler, it is unfortunately an illness I have some expertise in, but I am far from unique, far from it. There are few families on this island untouched by the illness of addiction. Statistics suggest that one in ten people are dealing with alcoholism. Alcohol has become the third most common reason for why people are admitted to psychiatric wards. It is estimated that every seven hours somebody in Ireland on this island dies because of alcohol abuse. The statistics for illegal and prescription drug uses are no better, uh, similarly for problem gambling. Yet problem gambling is not even currently recognised as a public health issue, and this needs addressed urgently. Most health trusts do not uh, keep records of those presenting themselves with this illness. And despite this, we know that a problem gambler is 15 times more likely to take his or her own life uh, as a result of their illness. We do not have any dedicated health department treatment centres here in the north to help problem gamblers. Some will have to pay for treatment in the south. This is not good enough. Addiction not only ruins lives, it costs lives either by overuse or by suicide. The outworkings of addiction on society cost their health service vast sums of money. 
It costs our police service, judicial service, prison service vast sums of money, never mind the societal damage it does. We are currently engaged in a false economy. If we are talking about doing things better, then why not try better to treat the illness and not the symptoms? Why not treat the illness in the same way we treat any other illness within our health service, with proper funds and resources? Most people, thankfully, can take a drink, bet in the bookies or online, take prescription drugs or even illegal drugs without fear nor hinder. Good luck to them, but for Would those the who can't, let's start recognising addiction as an illness and let's start helping uh, treat sufferers and resource uh, the services needed to do so. And I call Chris Little, and if he's succinct, we may be able to get Ms Woods in for a brief period. Thank you, Temporary Speaker. I'll, I'll be extremely brief. I welcome the opportunity to speak in support of the need for the Northern Ireland Executive to prioritise and deliver improved mental health and wellbeing provision for our society. I will speak briefly in relation to the statutory duty on the Minister of Health to cooperate with executive colleagues to deliver a joined-up cross-departmental approach to improved mental health and well-being. I would use this opportunity to ask the Minister of Health to address the apparent failure to reference the Department of Education and Public Health Agency Emotional Health and Wellbeing Framework for Children and Young People in the Department of Health Mental Health Action Plan and to work closely with the Minister of Education to ensure this framework is adequately resourced to contribute to improved mental health and well-being for children and young people. I would also ask the Health Minister to meet with the Northern, Northern Ireland Youth Forum and other young people involved in the Elephant in the Room campaign and to allocate officials and resources at his disposal to support the delivery of the substantive proposals made by this youth-led campaign. These include the creation of a youth mental health and wellbeing website to serve as a safe online space that would host relevant signposting information and provide an online support platform that would allow young people to ask questions and receive real-time support to meet their need at an early stage of intervention. Elephant in the Room proposals also include the explicit inclusion of mental health in addition to physical health in the education curriculum. I would propose, therefore, that the Minister of Health allocate a specific Department of Health official and coordinate the allocation of an appropriate official from all other relevant executive departments to support the implementation of the youth-led Elephant in the Room proposals. I hope the Health Minister will take these proposals seriously and act on them. And Mr Temporary Speaker, it is vital and indeed a legal duty that the Northern Ireland Executive Ministers cooperate to improve mental health and well-being in our community, and they will have the support of the Alliance Party to achieve the same. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Little. Uh, Ms Rachel Woods, you have three minutes. Three oh. minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was almost saying I was glad to see you up there. You're giving us a wee bit more to say, but uh, not. Um, despite the need, I don't think we talk about mental health enough, so I welcome the opportunity to do so tonight in the context of the COVID pandemic. But alongside a word of warning, we mustn't just talk about this. We actually need to deliver something. We know there is strong evidence that Northern Ireland has very high levels of mental illness and suicide rates are the highest in the UK, regardless of COVID. And despite this, Northern Ireland is the only region that does not have an overarching mental health strategy and the delivery of mental health treatments and care is fragmented and not properly resourced, so this must change. There is not one of us in this chamber that has not been directly affected or impacted by mental health issues, either personally, through family, friends and constituents, during COVID and beforehand. And there are many aspects of mental health that can be discussed today. Some have already have been where there's um, been issues before March 2 on what we need to do about perinatal mental health and tackling suicide, on addiction, on the absolute need for harm reduction in terms of that, on gambling, on domestic abuse, living conditions, workplace stress, those feeling lonely and anxious, and not to mention the fear that's very real at the moment because of potential mass redundancies being talked about in certain sectors. The COVID crisis will have so psychosocial impacts on people for years to come, and as we emerge from lockdown, the changes will pose more difficulties for mental health. This is just as true for everyone here as it is for children and young people, and I, like my colleague Mr Little, wish to use my very brief time today to focus on them and how they are still waiting. 
According to the Elephant in the Room report in July 2016, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child recommended that the Northern Ireland Executive rigorously invest in child and adolescent mental health services and develop strategies at national and devolved levels with clear timeframes, targets, indicators, effective monitoring mechanisms and sufficient human, technical and financial resources. At a follow-up event in October 2016, over 100 young people expressed their frustrations at the lack of mental health education and support services available here and called for the UN's recommendation to be fully implemented. So I reiterate this call in the chamber here today too. Some members of this chamber took part in a political pa panel a number of months ago now, organised by the Northern Ireland Youth Forum, to try and answer questions and concerns that young people had on COVID, covering issues from the economic impact, homelessness and housing, exams and school works, as some examples. What continued to be raised through the Young People's Survey and on the discussion was mental health and wellbeing, how young people are coping with COVID and what will happen after. In their response to their COVID survey, 62% of respondents said that mental health was a main issue that they faced as a young person right now, and 332 responses said that it was loneliness and isolation, with 361 saying fear and uncertainty, which we know all have impacts on mental health. This wasn't the first time that we as youth champions have engaged on young people's mental health. Earlier on in January, we attended a meeting at their head office on it, on the crisis that was being felt in young people's community. We heard horror stories of what people were going through and how important support was for them. And we heard loud and clear that youth mental health services were unable to meet the demand. The Children's Commissioner has also been clear about the need for a children's rights compliant mental health system, one which is responsive to children and young people as their needs arise. The challenges of the aftermath of COVID-19 are very, very real in all aspects of our lives, but our health and well-being should be at the forefront of any recovery. As the Minister has said, we have a massive task in front of us. There are competing demands for additional spending across many key areas. The government needs to live up to the commitments it made, but this executive needs to deliver and refocus the goals where they need to be. Properly resource services for people who need it. No more cuts could, to the could very the lady organisations bring her... that, I will, that exist to help others and support for people of all ages, especially children and young people, must be available. So, Mr. Speaker, we must, must not continue to prioritise GVA or GDP as the market of, soci of societal progress, but health and well-being as key to our just and green recovery for our generation and the generations to come. Thank you, Ms. Woods, and thank you to everyone who uh, kept to time. We're extremely grateful that the Minister, in a very busy schedule, has been able to sit through all of this debate. I'm now going to call the Minister of Health, Mr Robin Swan. Mr Swan, you've got 15 minutes. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr Temper Speaker, or should I give you your proper title, Father of the House, and I'm glad to see you eventually. Uh, to, <laughs> I, I was hoping you were going to come with the 10, to be quite honest. But no, uh, can I congratulate you on the way you, you've handled this debate here today, and can I thank the members um, who have brought the motion and the amendments, and also to all contributors, because I do think it shows the commitment to all in this House, no matter where we sit, on what party or at what level, should it be executive, chair of committee, health committee, or... Um, non-executive party representative well. I think the, the commitment and the conversation that has been had here uh, this evening truly reflects that there is a dedication and a commitment of those in this House to truly tackle mental health. I think the way that this House, this executive and this Assembly never has, has before. So I would like to thank the members for proposing uh, this motion and the amendments, which provides us with the opportunity con to consider the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our population's mental health and emotional well-being, and to discuss the need to prioritise mental health as a key element of the wider recovery of our society. Since taking up post as Minister of Health, I have been very clear that mental health is a priority to, to me, and also I am glad and thankful that that has been reciprocated by all my executive colleagues, and that has been demonstrated uh, by the establishment of the subcommittee on mental health, well-being, and suicide prevention. And just for, for one other minute, I know Mr. Little asked, could you know, could I assign a, a departmental official and work with other departmental officials to bring forward recommendations from the ele elephant in the room? I'll actually go a step further. I'll bring that the attention of the elephant in the room and the recommendations to it to that subcommittee the next time it meets, and also make sure that is on the agenda because I think the pressures on our young people um, as we come out of COVID, as we come out of lockdown but also in the changes in today's society in regards to the mental health and the pressures and the stresses are, that are there are something that we never experienced 
uh, when we were that age. So it's a, it's a commitment I'll give to you that we'll take that forward at that, at that point. For far too long, people have struggled to access appropriate mental health services when they need them. For far too long, suicide has cast a shadow over our communities and robbed us of too many young lives. Um, in regards to, I think it was a comment from Ms Flynn when she was moving her emotion in regards to the legal barriers of dual diagnosis, and she, she quoted a, a response to a written questions that, that she gave to me in regards to there are no legal barriers to dual diagnosis services. However, it is accepted that sometimes people with dual diagnosis experience difficulties actually accessing services because work has commenced to plan service recovery for addiction services across Northern Ireland as part of the recovery planning process. And I think that's something Mr McGuigan referred to as well. HSC Trusts will now look at how they can improve the care offered to patients with on ongoing and uh, co-occurring mental and alcohol and drug issues across the full range of existing treatment settings. And the issue of dual diagnosis issue will also be considered in the development of a new substance misuse strategy and in the new mental health strategy as well. So just to make that clear for the members that have come in and raised that issue today, it's something that we're aware of, it's something that we're working on. And I do want to, to acknowledge as well, I think it was in Ms Cameron's, um, Mrs Cameron's contribution at the start, was an acknowledgement to the officials who, throughout COVID, on the response that we had, kept mental health and kept working on the action plan um, and the strategy kept it live, kept it in the central place within my, within my department. I want to thank them for the support that they have given me and been able to do that. Because the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic has brought into stark reality how much we value our relationships, our freedom uh, and our health. Because this pandemic has changed lives around the globe to an extent that we could never have imagined. In Northern Ireland, the situation is no different. It has had a profound effect on our lives and for many people, the knock-on effects will be felt for many months, if not years to come. And members referred to that, and I, I think the starkest one, and I have said this is, is the beginning, for those who have lost loved ones due to this pandemic, th this virus, or even during this pandemic. It changed how we looked at death, or how we were able to respect death, or, or support those who actually needed it at the most trying times. And that is a challenge that is a fact that I think many families across Northern Ireland that will take a long time to recover while they catch up on that grieving process, the mess of the wake, the mess of visiting somebody's house. It's a big thing that we do here across these islands, especially, especially on this island, about how we respect those families who are mourning and the ones who have been lost. So, in particular, the impact of the pandemic on our emotional well-being and mental health has the potential to be significant. And I know many of my Assembly colleagues are hugely concerned about this, and, and I share your concern, and my executive colleagues share that concern. But I would reassure you that I and my department have already taken a number of steps to mitigate and address the impact on mental health and wellbeing, because this is an issue that will remain high up on my agenda going forward. Members will be aware on the 19th of May 2020, I published my department's mental health action plan which included a dedicated COVID-19 mental health response plan. This response plan provides immediate actions across seven themes to support mental health and emotional well-being in the face of this pandemic. There is a formation of a mental health and resilience working group, which is to coordinate the, re the response to the mental health and re re resilience strategic working group, which was established to drive this work at department level. To support this work, a cell was also established by the Health and Social Care Board to join together partners across sectors, including the voluntary and community organisations, to take this work forward on the ground. And I thank those members who took the time to mention so many community and voluntary organisations within their communities and within their, their constituencies as well. But there were so many more that weren't mentioned here tonight, and they are worth our thanks as well. Um, in regards to the immediate COVID mental health response, more, much work has been taken forward already, and it is having a significant impact. I have published a workforce wellbeing framework, which recognises the huge contribution the health and social care workforce across sectors have made to the pandemic response, often at the expense of their own emotional wellbeing. And I think it was it was referenced. I think it was, I, I think it was Ms. Brad, Mrs. Bradshaw. Um, who, who referenced about the strain and the stress on our health workers going to work every day. 
what is also apparent and what we also have to be cognizant of is the stress and the strains of those who were left in the house when they went out to work because that, that fear, that trepidation of who, what might come home or who might come home was always, was always there at their, at, at their minds as well. So it's about looking at the entire health family. In regards to the framework which we have produced includes a range of measures actually to enhance the psychological well-being of staff. And these include access to psychological support outlines manned by psychologists. And it's also accessible to care home and GP staff. And it also includes a broad range of online resources and drop-in services in critical facilities. A staff wellbeing working group has been established to oversee service delivery and review implementation of the framework. And my officials receive regular reports from the group. We have also provided material to support students who have joined the workforce early to ensure that the consistent public health messaging on mental health, the Public Health Agency continues to provide that Tech 5 messaging to help people stay emotionally well during this time of social distancing. The Minding Your Head website has been revamped to provide a wealth of information, support and advice to the public at this time, all centralised in one simple to access website. A range of online and printed resources also have been developed to support our children and young people at this immensely difficult time. Psychological first aid training has been approved and rolled out across Northern Ireland to ensure that help and support can be provided early. Stress control classes have been provided free of charge online, and the six sessions are delivered across three weeks on YouTube. The classes have proven very popular, with the uptake for the second class between 6,000 and 8,000 people across the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. And this is considered to be a very good uptake, and the initial indications of outcomes indicate an improvement in the stress resilience of those attending. The third iteration of stress control started on the 8th of June, and further classes will be available for the whole population across Northern Ireland and will start every month from July through to December. It is recognised, as I said earlier, that a large number of people have suffered from bereavement during this pandemic. To support those who have lost a loved one and to support those who are providing help and care to the bereaved, we have published new support material and are developing, developing a bereavement care pathway. The Department of Health and the Department of Communities recently jointly launched a wellbeing hub uh, developed by Inspire in collaboration with the Public Health Agency and a consortium of community organisations. And this will ensure the consistency of messaging and support across sectors and will help to ensure the right information and advice is received by those who need it, especially those hard to reach individuals. And again, I would commend those working in the voluntary and community sector for the huge efforts they have made and continue to make to support their clients and wider society. I hope this reassures members that much help and support has been provided for mental health and emotional well-being during the pandemic. Mental health services during COVID-19 and service recovery have been mentioned, and large mental health services have continued throughout the pandemic. GPs have continued to see mental health patients, and referrals to special men- mental health services have continued. There has, however, been some changes in how services are delivered. Many face-to-face meetings have been changed to accommodate remote working, including phone calls and video communication for those with the most severe mental illness. Mental health inpatient services have continued, and all trusts have put in place stringent plans to ensure both patients and staff are safe. And this includes monitoring of service usage at local levels. The Health and Social Care Trust Mental Health Services, I think as Mr Middleton referred to, are reporting a drop and reduction of mental health referrals, with one trust reporting a drop of over 60 per cent in referrals to mental health services from GPs between the beginning and the middle of March. However, the same trust has since then seen a steady increase with referrals, now at levels higher than pre-COVID-19. Community mental health services have seen a change in usage, and services have been continued where it has been detrimentally, det- sorry, determined clinically suitable. At no point has there been a blanket stopping of mental health community services. As we now move towards the reset and recovery phase, all trusts have developed recovery plans to bring services back to normal. In doing so, they are incorporating the learning from the pandemic to make the services better as we go forward. 
I am only too aware that we are at the stage of a surge in mental health needs. Early intervention evidence indicates an increase in need, especially for low-level depression and anxiety. Our local health and social care trusts are reporting increases in referrals, heightened acuity of patients and, in general, trends towards new and increased pressures across the secondary mental health services. So much is required to ensure the mental health response to COVID-19 can meet and adapt to the new challenges and to ensure that all who need mental health and care uh, will receive it. I recently announced uh, the creation of a mental health champion who will support and inform our work on the mental health recovery from COVID-19. The champion will be a public advocate for mental health, communicating the collective voices of people with lived experience, their families and carers, and communities impacted by mental health inequalities. My expectation for the mental health champion is that they will work across public, voluntary and dependent sectors and wider society to help better integrate mental health into policies and provide advice to these stakeholders. To ensure that a champion is in post to help with the post-COVID-19 mental health response, I am in hope to be in a position to announce an interim appointment within the matter of days. In conclusion, Mr Temporary Speaker, as I have said many times, mental health is one of my top priorities. I am honoured and privileged to be in a position where I can drive strategic change and improvement to mental health services and to improve the psychological well-being and mental resilience of the population. I fully recognise the importance of a mental health response going forward, and it is important that this is not forgotten in our recovery planning. The creation of a mental health champion, the implementation of Action Plan and Protect Life 2, and the creation of a new mental health strategy will ensure that we have better services for the future. When we do this, it is impossible not to recognise the immense work done by our dedicated mental health workers, both in the health and social care system and in the community and voluntary sector. Without their dedication, we would be in a much worse place. In the transformation of our mental health services that are ongoing, I am fully committed to the co-production and recognise the importance of listening and including all who can help in transforming our services. This includes people with lived experience who know what works for them and have valuable lessons that we can learn from, and the community and voluntary sector who can truly help us transform services. I am therefore, Mr Temporary Speaker, happy to support this motion and the amendments, and I am thankful for the members who brought it to this House and to all the members who contributed. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for your acknowledgement that I am indeed the father of the House, which is the longest server, not the oldest member of this Assembly. There are even people in this room who are older than I am. So thank you, thank you very much for that acknowledgement. Yes, I will identify them later on. I am now going to call upon Mr Mike Nesbitt to uh, summit on uh, the second amendment. And Mr Nesbitt, you have got five minutes. Uh, speaker, thank you very much indeed. Um, at the risk of sounding patronising, can I just start by commending you on such a, such a polished performance? in the chair. Um, makes me wonder, have you ever considered a career in politics? <laughs> um, as ever, I look forward to the day when we debate and sign off on the programme for government, which is still in draft form. Uh, and I remain colleagues that the purpose is to improve the well-being of all by tackling disadvantage and by driving economic growth. And I can think of nothing more disadvantageous than poor mental health and well-being. And in terms of driving economic growth, what better could we do than to ensure that the thousands, the tens of thousands, who are economically inactive, not because they want to be, but because they don't have the capacity to be active. If we could fix that, what a magnificent achievement that would be. So I thank Pam Cameron for bringing the motion because it's absolutely uh, on message. Uh, and, and she's made it clear at some time in our lives, one in five of us can expect to have a mental health issue. And she gave us some shocking statistics to back that, uh, and made it clear that that's the current situation before uh, we get through this public health crisis. And the impact of COVID-19 is certain to get worse when we exit furlough and we enter what could be a recession or even a depression. Uh, and I also thank Pam 
uh, for making clear right from the get-go that she supports both amendments. I think it is hateful when this House divides on an issue of mental health, particularly when it is a non-binding motion, as this one is. I also thank Olea Flynn for bringing her amendment uh, and also for making clear, as many members have, that this is not just the responsibility of the Minister for Health. This is a cross-cutting issue. In the same way we say to the Minister of Education, you are not solely responsible for educational underachievement. Healthier children do better in schools. Well-fed children do better. Children in good housing do better. As Mr Carroll says, the environment is important as a, as a factor in influencing poor mental health uh, and well-being. And I, I also believe, temporary speaker, that we need to look at this not just as a medicalised model. It's not all about pills and tablets, as Mr Butler said, moving the Second Amendment. Kindness can be better than the tablet. This is the same Mr Butler who said he wouldn't speak for long because Pam Cameron and Aaliyah Flynn had covered it all and then spoke for nine minutes and 41 seconds. But it was good stuff. It, it was good stuff. But it's not all about pills and tablets. It's about being sociable. Social prescribing we are all used to these days. What about the carers? Uh, Mrs Bradshaw mentioned the carers. There's a shocking number of young carers. And perhaps for them, the development of mental health issues because they're caring and perhaps missing out on a normal childhood is a slow burn. Uh, Cara Hunter mentioned the need for coordination. I think we all agree with that, and, and I thank her for this time. She did not mention the, her age at the signing of the Belfast Agreement in 1998. And, and talking of, of contributions from youthful members, uh, Mr Hilditch, the youngest member of the class in 1998, talked about debt. Well, you don't tackle debt with a pill or a tablet. And often the best people to tackle that sort of thing are members of the community and voluntary sector. Uh, and I think we need to look at them. And, and Ms Flynn will know from chairing the suicide group, the all-party group on suicide awareness and prevention, that in terms of Protect Life 2, the new strategy on suicide, the big concern in the community is that small voluntary community sector groups who have been dealing with this issue in the community, not for years but for decades, are fearful that the tendering process will knock them out that some big organisation, possibly from across the water, will come in because they're good at tendering, but they're not necessarily so good uh, at delivering these services. Uh, and I know Mr Sheehan talked about uh, the White Rock Children's Group, and, and he talked about Good Morning West Belfast. Befriending, as I discovered as a Victims Commissioner, is a very simple, cost-effective way of engaging with people and trying to make sure that they feel loved, that they're not alone, and that these are things are really important to their mental health and well-being. And finally, temporary speaker, I've known Robin Swan since we were both elected in 2011. I'm telling you now, we have a minister who is serious and deeply committed to tackling mental health, and I thank him for that and for being here this evening. Thank you, Mr Nesbitt. And I call upon Colm Gildenew to wind on amendment number one. And Mr Gildenew, you've got five minutes. Colm Helgut, can I call you Shaladak and Kogarjus? Um, congratulations on your promotion to the, uh, to the speaker. Um, I would like to welcome also the motion being taken here today. I think it's a, a fantastic motion and I would like to acknowledge the work that the, the proposer has put in and also the people who have put down amendments to the motion and the work that they've done individually and together to bring this, this motion to the House today. Um, I think there's been a lot of ground covered, and I don't propose at this time of the evening to go over that ground again. I suppose there are a couple of issues that I would like to pick up on, um, the first of which being uh, the issue of cures, I think, and the additional burden that has been placed on cures throughout this very difficult time. I think it's an area that is often considered last, and supports for that, that hard-pressed group are often uh, not mobilised quickly enough, and that can have a huge impact on their mental health. And I think we should give that some consideration in the time ahead. I would also like to acknowledge the Minister's commitment to mental health in terms of his statements and in, in terms of his actions to date, and uh, his commitment to working with everyone else, and, and the, the importance that is given by this House that, that this is indeed a cross-cutting uh, measure, and something that we need to get right if we want to 
improve the poor mental health uh, statistics that we are, we are dealing with, but also, as has been mentioned, in terms of our well-being, prosperity, economic growth, all of that depends on us getting this part of the equation right. And I think it's, it's good that we have a collective will in relation to that. One of the other issues in terms of the all-party groups that I attend is the issue of loneliness. It has been touched upon here today, and I think it's appropriate that it was. Loneliness is more and more recognised as, as potentially as damaging for physical health as it is for mental health, and therefore ends up putting a strain on mental, on mental health services in the first case, but also in physical health services. So I think it's important that we start to look at strategies for dealing with loneliness across a range of sectors, um, older people, but also younger people, where we have significant concerns both in terms of mental health and loneliness. Uh, and also in terms of rural communities, I think we need to look at how we can reach into those communities and provide ways to support them on an ongoing basis. I welcome the Minister's um, mention there of early intervention. And from my own experience working as a social worker on a, on a crisis response team, I can, I can confirm that early intervention is just as important for mental health as it is for physical health. And that's not only in terms of the outcomes for the individual concerned, but in terms of the complexity of treatment that's required, how chronic that, that condition can be. If we could start to move resources into earlier intervention, I think we will, over a period of time, see significant improvements. Um, there has been, rightly, a huge acknowledgement in the Chamber today for community groups who have helped in this emergency crisis, who have stepped up and filled some of the roles that for a period of time just were absent in terms of statutory service or in terms of the new reality that we faced at a period of time. Um, in my own area, Neve Louise, um, a lot of the GAA and the other sporting groups, uh, pop-up COVID groups who formed overnight and provided food and support to their local areas were all very much welcome. In relation to that, I welcome the contribution around the community and voluntary sector, but I must say that I am slightly disappointed that in terms of the management board that we don't see more of those community and voluntary voices, but I would be hopeful that there will be a way found to include a wider range of voices in that conversation. Um, in terms of rebuilding or indeed building new services, I think it's vital that we get as broad a range of, of perspectives as possible. So. Um, the other thing that I think we heard about today, and it, it, it is a theme that we have dealt with on the Health Committee as well, is the issue of addictions. And I want to acknowledge the very personal and uh, experience shared in, in the House today in relation to that area of addictions. Um, dual addictions are, and, and dual diagnosis are well recognised as some of the most difficult uh, areas to get help and support into. And again, that is where we need to put our resources. So I would just like to uh, commend the motion and the amendments and to once again thank everyone for bringing them forward here today. Uh, thank you to both Mr Nesbitt and Mr Gildon, who indeed did wind and summate on what had been said. Uh, finally, I'm going to call upon Mr Alex Easton to conclude and wind up the debate. Mr Easton, you've got 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Temporary uh, Speaker. I rise to wind on the motion. I um, just want to say a few words uh, before I, I get on to members' comments. I want to say thank you to all the members in the Chamber this evening for supporting the motion and the amendments. And that means an awful lot to me, as you'll maybe see as we go on. And I think the people of Northern Ireland will be delighted to see that we all can actually agree on a motion. And I think that's the way to go, and it's something for us all to remember, I hope. How many times has the Assembly debated mental health debates over the years? Probably dozens of times. Yet, despite all the debates and all the initiatives by successive ministers, we never seem to be able to really get where we want to and get on top of the issue of mental health. And yet, it is a huge issue. So that's why I'm so pleased at the response by members this evening. It's not an easy thing for me to do or say, but I suffer from anxiety and depression, and at times it is difficult. Every day, at times, it can be a battle for me. Some will think it is a weakness on my part to admit this. You can be the loneliest person in the world, yet be the busiest, especially for me, being a politician. Yet you live your life helping others, but you're scared to admit your own vulnerabilities because of what others may think. 
As we start to come out of lockdown and the world around us starts to crank up, the impact that COVID-19 has had on our mental health and wellbeing is going to be staggering. And we as an assembly must all come together to tackle what will be a huge task before us. The impact of COVID-19 on mental health is expected to be severe. International evidence indicates short and long-term direct effects on mental health and psychological well-being, and in some cases, increased suicide and post-traumatic stress. The causes have had a direct effect on psychological well-being are clearly identified. These are social distancing, isolation, bereavement, unemployment, financial hardship, the inability to access health and social care services, and increased work pressures, and people who have been having to shield for months may actually feel anxious and unsure about going outdoors. We need to help them. Early indications in Northern Ireland showed for those with the most severe mental health showed an actual drop in demand between February and March. However, since then, demand has increased significantly, and the daily bed occupancy level is around 95%. That's quite staggering. There's also an increase and new presentations of those seeking, seeking mental health services. This is a problem we are experiencing because of COVID-19, but in Northern Ireland before COVID-19 pandemic, we find mental illness is the largest cause of ill health and disability in Northern Ireland, and that's a fact. Prior to the pandemic, Northern Ireland is estimated to have had higher levels of mental illness than other regions in the UK, with one in five adults, 185,000 people. That's absolutely immense having a mental health problem all at the same time. 21% of women and 16% of men had mental health issues. 45,000 children have mental health issues problems across Northern Ireland. 45,000. And in 2015, there were 318 suicides. And despite the Northern Ireland Suicide Prevention Strategy and Protect Life Strategy, we still continue to have a huge issue. I believe there are so many processes and initiatives out there that are good and positive, but at times it is maybe simplicity which will help our mental health and well-being the best. We in this assembly on this issue must support the health minister to do all he can to help our population, and you've got my support. The challenges of how we work, how we're able to interact, and how we can even visit our loved ones will all change and have changed due to COVID-19. That is why the Minister's launch of the strategic framework for rebuilding services will be so important. It is vital that mental health and well-being are at the centre of this. The Minister for Health has announced some good things and good strategies, such as the process for a mental health champion. Their role will be vital over this period and will be needed to support the community and the staff in the health and social care sector, who must not be forgotten about. The new Executive Working Group on Mental Health and Wellbeing has been established. This is going to be vital also, and they must prioritise mental health as we work through coronavirus-19 pandemic outcomes. And with the coronavirus-19, I will warn people that this virus is far from over, and we have a long way to go, and we can't forget that. It's vital that we provide advice, and the Mental Health Response Plan must provide this. Important support such as online classes for stress control, apps to access libraries for reading, support for health staff, especially nurses and social care workers, and dealing with our past, which we as an assembly have failed to do. We must remember the independent sector and those offering counselling services to help us address mental health waiting lists. Their input and help is going to be crucial, and funding must be made a priority for them. We need them to be able to open as a matter of urgency. We do not have a happy population, and we have to ask ourselves why. Have we been part of that reason? And what are we going to do to address it? And hopefully today's motion will go a long way to help. And that's why I'm delighted at the response of members tonight. Mr. Speaker, I will now address some of the comments, hopefully in time, um, as I work my way through them. Um, Pam Cameron, um, first of all, thank you for bringing the motion. Um, mentioned about mental health needs to be at the front of health. Um, she mentioned that she wanted to work with a minister and praised frontline health staff. Jerry Carroll said that uh, Stormont had failed to protect people with mental health and that 26% underspend in mental health spending uh, and that needed to be addressed. Paula Bradshaw said the focus on those in lockdown and, and what they'd been through and that we, we needed to focus on that mentioned the spike in sexual offences and praised the many organisations which had helped deal with this. 
mentioned the mental health action plan and that there needs to be serious investment. Hope that's accurate. <laughs> um, the column, Gilder knew the chair. Um, I will come on to you last, sorry. Orlea Flynn um, said there was a challenge to improve mental health and wellbeing and um, mentioned substance abuse strategy and thanked the minister for supporting her on that. Wants the minister to be the champion for mental health and worried about the lack of funding for a mental health action plan. Pat Sheehan mentioned um, and commended the, the community and the voluntary sector, mentioned about disadvantaged areas and how affected they had been uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic, said there was a serious mental health crisis before COVID and wanted to highlight that, and wanted parity of funding between mental health and physical health. Rachel Woods mentioned um, that we don't speak about mental health enough. I hope I did today. Uh, and words were no longer enough. And I agree, they're not, low. They're, they're not enough anymore. We've been here too many times and we need to do something about it. Robbie Butler, I have to say I've been impressed with you tonight the most. I've been impressed with everyone, but you were actually outstanding. So I'll never say that to you again, but you were. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a one-off. You mentioned about perimental health and how important it was. Uh, we needed to tackle addictions and poverty and mentioned about tackling gambling, I'm wanting to target uh, a zero suicide rate. Very commendable if we could do that. Once real progress on mental health and the action plan, mentioned loneliness and isolation, said we needed to try harder, thank the health staff and those in the community and stated we can't do this without them. Ms. Hunter um, said we needed to plug the gap in mental health um, and mentioned about support for voluntary groups and the support that they needed. Mentioned the rural community, which I don't think many people had, so well done to mention in that and their, their need for support. Mentioned about bereavement support services and the help that they need. David Hiltage mentioned about uh, the impact on the community on mental health uh, due to the lockdown mentioned about debt and one in four people with debt with mental health issues and the stress of financial insecurity and unemployment. Gary Middleton um, mentioned about the minister had shown a commitment to tackle mental health, which I do agree with. Mental health was already a serious issue before COVID-19 and mental health affected so many different people right across society. Philip McGuigan um, mentioned about the community had rallied around as a result of COVID-19. Um, mentioned addiction services and was disappointed at the lack, the lack of uh, addiction services um, and not being really mentioned. So well done on that. So just finally to say thank you everybody for supporting the motion. Um, it's really made me very happy tonight to see that and let's move forward together and improve the lives of our people. Thank you. We overran by 38 seconds, which is not too bad. Uh, that's the debate, not Mr Easton. Uh, could I thank everyone who has made this uh, such an easy debate to, to chair as temporary speaker? Uh, could I pay tribute to Mr Easton and Mr McGuigan for their honesty and courage they've shown in the debate tonight? Uh, that has, I think, added to the debate. I could also thank Mr Chambers and Mr O'Dowd, who sat through the debate but didn't get a chance to speak. I think that's an example to other MLAs to show an interest in a debate, even though they don't get a chance to, to stand up. I now move to the First Amendment, that's the amendment standing in the name of Orlea Flynn, Pat Sheehan, Philip McGuigan and Colm Gildenew. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no, if any. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed. Uh, the next question is the amendment number two standing in the name of Mr Nesbitt and Mr Robbie Butler. Uh, that that be made. All those in favour say aye. Uh, contrary, any noes? No noes. Therefore, I, su I suggest that the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is then that the motion as amended be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Any against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Uh, item five in the order paper is the adjournment. Before I put the question, could I remind members that the next plenary session is next Tuesday, the 30th of June.